the crowd participation part. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, let's better. Let's all stand up together. Sing this with me. Sing silent night. Oh. Good direction. 
Um, also, Kathy Fisher, uh, she'll be starting her radiation treatments this week, so pray for her. Uh, of course, Dolly Wadlow and Brother Jim continue to pray for them. Uh, they have not been able to be here uh, at the church since this started, and so, uh, but they are faithful uh, to give, and they check on the church, and they call and different things, uh, but uh, we, we just miss seeing them in person. And, uh, and so continue to pray for them. Sharon Hampton still recovering from that kidney transplant. Uh, she has good days, bad days. Uh, so uh, we want to continue to pray for her as well. Lee and Mark Vincent, uh, pray for them. I know Brother Stan is not feeling well today. Uh, and let me give you a quick update on uh, the baby uh, that we put on the prayer list, uh, Silas Kessling. Uh, I want to uh, give you a praise item because prayer does work. Last Sunday, uh, they didn't know for sure uh, if, if the baby was even going to make it or not. There was a lot of uncertainty. Uh, it was just uh, two weeks old. Uh, well, long story short, the baby got to come home on Thursday, and everything seems to be well. And so let's give the Lord a hand. Uh, for that. Um, also, I would ask you to pray for uh, my uncle's family, Lewis Smith. Uh, he, we've been praying for him for quite some time. He did pass away this week. And so if you would remember uh, my mom's family in relation to that. They've been really, my mom's been hit pretty hard uh, with everything. Between my stepdad, my grandma, now my uncle, uh, it's, it's been a little bit overwhelming. So pray, pray for those families. My family's just one family. Uh, there's lots of families out there dealing with a lot of things. So let's just... Pray for them, but most importantly, uh, let's pray for this season and remembering why we celebrate Christmas, and let's pray for the lost. Pray for those that don't really understand and enjoy uh, the Christmas season. They may enjoy it, uh, but maybe for the wrong reasons. And so let's pray that God really makes himself aware to all men and all women, all boys, all girls, uh, that he might be glorified in our life today. Would you bow with me? And uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, I'm going to ask Ron Schrager if he would. Brother Ron, would you care uh, to lead us in prayer, please? Father, we thank you for bringing us together this morning. Father, we ask that you remember those that have lost loved ones. Father, we ask that you also remember those that need our prayers. Father, we ask that you touch those that are Even whenever we can't verbalize it. 
We hope that this Christmas season is a special one for you. And we hope you enjoy these next few songs.
this series last week. Uh, we talked about the Christmas season and talking about the things that I think are important to all of us. One of the things uh, that we talked about last week was that unspeakable gift. Uh, and whenever we talk about unspeakable, uh, it's a little bit confusing sometimes whenever we uh, kind of relate ourselves or think about the word unspeakable uh, can mean a lot of different things. But uh, on different occasions in the Bible, it talks about uh, this unspeakable joy uh, that came to us in the form of a baby. And then it also talks about the unspeakable gift that God has given to us. And so it's important that whenever we talk about unspeakable joy and the unspeakable gift, uh, we need to understand that it means a number of things, but the most important thing that we would understand is not the fact that it's forbidden to talk about, uh, but actually it's so intimate, it's so pure, it's so honest, it's so genuine uh, to us, and we're so overwhelmed by this gift and this joy that it shouldn't be contained with inside of us. We should desire and want to tell the whole world about this unspeakable joy that God has given us by offering us an unspeakable gift. And that unspeakable one is Jesus. Jesus brings joy and Jesus was the gift. Today I want to talk to you more about uh, the fact that Jesus... As he came in that form of a babe, uh, he brought to us light, he brought to us a light that shines, and he brought to us a love that surpasses all other love. And I, I'm just going to be honest with you today, uh, I'm going to just, I'm going to throw lots of scripture at you. Uh, so I hope that you're listening quick, and I hope uh, that I don't linger long, uh, because I've just got a tremendous amount of uh, scripture that I was going through uh, whenever we were preparing uh, for this particular service, talking about the life, the light, and the love of Jesus. Would you pray with me once again? Father, I want to say thank you again. Thank you for Brother Phil, the good uh, presentation, the songs, God, that fill our soul <coughs> and brings memories to our mind and our heart uh, whenever we sing those Christmas songs that help us to celebrate uh, the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you will hide us behind the cross today. Let your word speak to us. Let it be food for our soul. God, let it be encouragement uh, and let it be everything that you intended for it to be uh, in each one of our lives, individually and distinctly. Father, thank you again for another precious time to worship you and to worship together as a church family. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me start talking about the light. How that Jesus brought light into a very dark world. Now, if any of us get some inclination that the year 2020 was some kind of dark, depressive, demonic year, let me assure you, that there has been worse years, there has been worse circumstances in history, maybe not in your and I lifetime, but in history, there is no doubt darkness has always been around. There are dark days that we have lived through in the past, but Jesus came to bring light. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, This is the message that we heard and we announced to you. That is, God is light. And in Him, there is no darkness at all. In God Himself, there is this radiant light that beams forth into our life that we can understand that we don't have to live in darkness. Even though everything around us is dark, depressing, and, and degrading uh, all the things that we enjoy or want to be uh, doing in our life. Maybe this year has brought darkness to your life, but with God, we can always be in the glorious light that He gives us. What I began to realize throughout this study is that there is an extraordinary amount of Old Testament scriptures that refer to God's light. 
And, and I want to just try to share some of those. Some of those are prophetic, uh, and then some of them uh, have just meaning uh, for the day and time that they were written. In Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 4, it says, His coming is a brilliant, is as brilliant as the sunshine. Rays of light flash from his hands where his awesome power is hidden. And so this is a prophetic scripture speaking of the one coming, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and how that in his hands would be these rays of light and how that it would be it's more brilliant uh, than even the sunshine uh, would be. Another prophetic scripture out of Ezekiel chapter 43, uh, verse 2 says, Suddenly, the glory of the God, the glory of the God of Israel appeared from the east. The sound of his coming was like the roar of rushing waters, and the whole landscape shone with his glory. Whenever God came, whenever God sent Jesus into this world and he brought light, there was this radiant glow that encompassed the entire world. Now you say, Brother Dennis, I know the story. I've read it in the Bible. Uh, and there was a light that shone over Bethlehem uh, that guided the wise men. Uh, but it doesn't say anything about a light glowing so brightly that it shone upon uh, all of the landscape. But what it's talking about is a spiritual landscape. Whenever Jesus came, he shone light into the darkness. And darkness is always equivalent in Scripture to sin and evil and Satan. And light is always a reference to righteousness, purity, and God and Jesus Christ. And so this light, whenever Jesus came, it put forth this encompassing glory that shines still yet today in our lives. And we need to be thankful for it. Amen. In Psalm chapter 50, verse 2, it says, From Mount Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines in glorious radiance. In perfected beauty, God came at a perfect time. At a perfect time, God sent His Son into this world so that sin could be defeated and darkness could be abolished. I don't know why God chose that specific time. I don't know why we are here at this specific time. But I know that God's timing is perfect in all of its ways. And even whenever we look at God sending and bringing forth light for Jesus, we need to understand that there is a perfect beauty within God's timing. We should not question that. Listen, you may be going through some very dark times in your life. You may be dealing with cancer. You may be dealing with death. You may be dealing with sickness. I don't know what you're dealing. You may be dealing uh, with depression. You may be dealing with financial hardships. I don't know what you're dealing with, but if you are in the light of God, Timing is perfect. And even in those most depressing and dark and hard times, we need to acknowledge that God is light. And in the midst of that trying time, we need to trust that God's perfect time is his perfect time. And trust him and believe in him in that way. And another important factor that I began to find whenever I was studying out and looking at the fact that God sent light is that there is a, a fear portion that goes with light in Scripture. Even whenever Luke records the account of the angels coming and announcing the birth of Jesus. In Luke chapter 2 verse 9. It says. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were filled with fear. They were filled with fear. As they observed this, this awesome occurrence. And these angels appearing to them. There is a fear that came into them. Where does that fear reside? Where does that come from? Well, that comes from our sinful nature. And throughout Scripture, light and fear, light of God, fear of man, have always correlated. 
Now here's the problem that we're facing as a culture and even as a nation. Is that the fear of God has seemingly diminished over time. I don't know why. I don't know the answer. I don't know uh, exactly when it started or where it will end. But I know this. If the fear of God is not in you, you are lacking wisdom. Because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And so going all the way back into some Old Testament, we find this correlation of fear and life. Psalms 94 1 says, O Lord God, or Lord, O Lord, God of vengeance, O God of vengeance, twice over the psalmist, it, it exemplifies the fact that God is a vengeful God. He says, shine forth. Let your light shine forth upon us that we might understand that you are a jealous God. You are a vengeful God. And if we are not in accordance to your will, your plan, your way, there are consequences to that realization. And so allowing God's light to shine in this world is important. Again, in Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 4, it says, Then the glory of the Lord rose up from above the cherubim, and he went over to the door of the temple. The temple was filled with this cloud of glory, this light emitting from this cloud in the midst of the temple. And the courtyard glowed brightly with the glory of the Lord. Now let me just give you a little bit Old Testament uh, rehash here that you may remember or you may not. But whenever they would offer a sacrifice, the, 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 the presence of God would, would start at the entrance of the courtyard of the tabernacle. Now I'm talking about whenever they would offer the yearly sacrifice, the sin sacrifice. Remember in the uh, wilderness uh, that the cloud would guide them by day and the pillar of fire would guide them by night? Well, whenever they were wandering in the wilderness, they would take that tabernacle and erect it, and whenever it was time for them to offer the yearly sin sacrifice, that cloud, that presence of God, would stand before the courtyard of the temple. The priest would go in, and in the courtyard, they would offer a sacrifice. There in the courtyard, that's where the altar was at. They, uh, that's where the blood was shed and all of those things. And so they would offer this sacrifice. If the sacrifice was acceptable unto God, then the cloud, the light, would go forth and would reside inside the courtyard of the temple. And then the priest would go one time a year into the Holy of Holies. It was forbidden for anyone to go into the Holy of Holies except for the priest one time a year. And so the priest would go in. And if God accepted this sin sacrifice, then the presence of God would enter into the Holy of Holies with the priest, and it was signifying that God accepted this sacrifice that was made. But let's backtrack. Because whenever that presence of God would stand at the courtyard, at the gate of the courtyard of the tabernacle, whenever the priest went in and offered the sacrifice for that particular family, if that sacrifice was not acceptable to God, now I can list out a number of reasons why that might be, but assuredly it was something that they as a family had done and they had not adhered to in the law of God. But if the priest, if so a family would bring the sacrifice given to the priest, the priest would take it in. If he offered that sacrifice on the altar, if God was not acceptable of that sacrifice, the presence of God would leave the tabernacle. That was bad news for that family. There was fear, there was anxiety, there was anxiousness to see whether the presence of God would come into the courtyard or would go out because that signified whether you were forgiven or not forgiven. 
There should be an element of fear whenever we talk about the light of God. There should be something within us that yearns, that looks at, that takes note of whether we are acceptable unto God or whether God through our spirit is telling us, get things right. Straighten your life in accordance to the will of God, whatever it might be. But the Old Testament is full of these types of things. Hosea 6.5 says, Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and the judgments are as the light that goeth forth. The vengeance is referred to as light. The judgment of God is referred to as light. And so even when those angels came to those shepherds and announced the fact that the birth of Jesus was born, the fear that they inquired of relates back into the Old Testament of whether this child, whether this star, whether this born baby would be the true Messiah acceptable unto God or whether or not because they knew that without the Messiah there was no more forgiveness of sin. There was a 500 year time frame uh, between John the Baptist and Jesus uh, or between the last prophet and John the Baptist coming on the scene. No word from God. No message from God. Could you imagine that? We have had one year where we have felt like maybe God is punishing our nation. Could you imagine not hearing from God for over 500 years? And so whenever Jesus came, remember John had prophesied that he would be the one, and he had acknowledged him as he came onto the banks of the Jordan River. And so there was anxiety, there was anxiousness to know whether Jesus was truly the Messiah or not, because it related to that light. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, it says, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So not only did the light represent fear, but the light also represented hope. We may talk more about hope next week, but the reality is this. Whenever the shepherd or whenever the wise men came to inquire, they saw the star there in the east as it had been predicted uh, by prophecy and by uh, astrology and all of those things. And so they come and they inquire where this king of the Jews, where he might be and where he was born. It provided hope. It, it provided uh, an assurance that God's perfect timing might be in play. And so they took that into consideration. Let me quickly share just a few other scriptures in relation to that. Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, it says, While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. This is whenever John the Baptist had taken Jesus, whom he had just acknowledged as being the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. He came down into the Jordan River. John baptized Jesus, and as he came up, there was this brilliant cloud, this bright, shining cloud that encompassed that entire area and all of those that were there could see it. And so they began to wonder, what does this bright light mean? And then the voice of God comes and says, Behold, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. An acceptable gift offered to God. Even Jesus himself had to offer this gift to God, his life. For the sins of the world. And so light is represented throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, and it provides hope. Matthew 28, 3 says, His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 says, After all this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven with great authority, and the earth grew bright with his splendor. 
There's going to be a day that Jesus is coming again. He's going to split the clouds of glory. And he's going to come to take his church to be home with him forever and ever. And I'll assure you, whenever that day comes, there's going to be a brilliant light. And whenever that light shines, and you see a host of angels, and you see the Son of God coming in his triumphal entry, my friend, I hope you're ready. Because at that point, if you're not ready, it's too late. You say, oh, Brother Dennis, that's not fair. It's totally fair. God has given us everything that we need to know about salvation, about truth, about the peace and the joy and the forgiveness of God. God does not have to apologize for anything that he does. He's righteous and just in all of his ways. And so we need to understand that Jesus brought light into the world. And it helped to reaffirm all of those Old Testament scriptures that relate to the light of God. Secondly, Jesus brought love. A beautiful love. A love that surpasses all others. In Jeremiah 31.3 it says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. It's always been God's plan. Not to destroy, not to harm, but it's always been God's plan to restore and to forgive. And so in that we see the everlasting love of God. Let me try to quickly share a few other scriptures. I told you I had a bunch. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. Remember? Remember the light that brought fear into the hearts of men? What expels that fear? The love of God. Whenever you have the love of God inside of you, you don't have to fear. You don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear sin. You don't have to fear man because you know you're in the will and the love of God. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, if it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Perfect God's perfect timing. God sent his son on that Christmas as we celebrate it today. For them, it was just another day. But for us, it's Christmas, the birth of our Savior. In John chapter 15, 13, it says this, Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for a friend. That's Jesus. That's Jesus' love for you. He was willing to lay down his life for the sins of the world. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. God even gives us an, or a, a demand, a consequence, a realization that if we've experienced the love of God, if we've experienced uh, the free pardon of sin, where we don't have to fear that any longer, then we should, in like fashion, love one another. I don't think we've had a very good demonstration of love in the past years. Not just in the year 2020, but I can go back and look at our nation, and we can look at our history, and we can see that God's love has not shined forth the way it should. Not even in the church has it come forth the way it should. That's my fault. That's your fault. That's our fault. Let's love one another because it's a demonstration of the presence and the power of God. 1 John 4, 16 says, We know how much God loves us. And we have put our trust in His love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God. And God lives in them. Amen. Love. It's a 
beautiful thing. There's one thing that I've realized throughout my 20 plus years of ministry. My words are fleeting. My words are not powerful. <laughs> my thoughts are not very high. And they're not very eloquent. But I'll assure you, the word of God is true and powerful. And that's why I share all of these scriptures with you today. Is because I would rather you hear it from the word of God itself. Because it can make an impact that I can't make. But it will only make an impact if you allow that word to feed your soul. Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Even in our sin, God demonstrated his love to us. What's that mean? That means there's still hope. That means if you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, there's love extended to you. And you can experience this love unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. Jesus brought light. Jesus brought love. But Jesus also brought life. In John 3.16, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Jesus brought light, love, and life for all of us to experience. And it should never be taken for granted. And it should never be overlooked. Romans chapter 8 verse 10 says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. He is planted inside of us, not a death, but a life. There's not very many churches that I think are demonstrating the good, powerful life of Christ. We sit, we, we go through the motions, we, we, we sit there with this, this look of depression or frustration, or I don't know if you're thinking about lunch, I don't know if you're thinking about last week, I don't know if you're thinking about the coming week, but there should be a time where you settle in, and this is the perfect place to truly worship the life and the love that God has bestowed upon us through Jesus. Amen. And that should bring a smile to all of our faces, knowing that God loved you that much. John 14 says, Jesus answered, If you knew the generosity of God and who I am, you would have asked of me for a drink because I would have refreshed you with living water. Speaking of the woman at the well who was there because she was rejected. She was looked down upon by society and by men and, and all of those things. She was a rejected individual. She was defeated in so many ways. She wouldn't come to the well with the rest of the women because they would criticize her and they would point out all of her imperfections and all of her sins and all of that guilt would just weigh on her so heavily. And so one day Jesus said, it's expedient for me to go into Jerusalem. And, and they said, well, Lord, you don't, you don't need to go there. That's a Samaria, actually, is where they went and through Samaria. And they said, Lord, you don't need to go there. He said, no, it's important for me to go. Because Jesus had a perfect timing. Jesus had a perfect plan. And so he comes to the woman and, and he finds the woman there and, and he sends the disciples forth and he asks the woman uh, for a drink and so she draws water for him to drink and he drinks of it and he makes this 
proclamation to the woman at the well. If you only would have known, you would have asked me to give you drink because I am living water. Life is in Christ. He brought the light, he brought the love, but he brought life to man, eternal life for all of us to enjoy. Ephesians chapter 2, and I'll wrap up here in just a few more scriptures. Ephesians 2, 4 says, but God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. God's grace, God's unmerited favor to man, and that's the forgiveness of sin. Another familiar scripture, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus brought life to all of us. John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you have to walk. You don't have to walk. You won't have to walk uh, in darkness because you will have the light that leads to what? 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 Life. life. God has extended to you light, love, and life. And it's for all of us to enjoy. It's all of us and all of our responsibility to remember through the Christmas season what Jesus brought to the table whenever he was born there in that nature. Scripture fulfills it. Scripture prophesies of it. Everything in the Word of God, it links together extraordinarily in a way that man can never put it together. That's what I realized as I began to look at Jesus bringing the light, the love, and the life to you and I. It's how the Scripture ties it all together and it can't be manipulated or destroyed. God's word is quick and powerful. It's what we need today. It's certainly what the world needs today. Amen. Would you stand with me? Father, I ask you today, God, take my feeble attempt to put forth your word and God, I pray that the Holy Spirit will take your message, your word, your truth. And God, I pray it will be as those arrows that will pierce the heart of men. And God, it will make us recognize and realize how blessed that we are, how good God is to us, and how much you are worthy to be praised. Father, forgive me for my neglect. Forgive me of, of my preferences and, and how that so many times, Father, I, I, my priorities are, are mixed up. I put things ahead of you and, and I try to align them so that you are just a part of it, but whenever in reality, God, you should be the number one priority in my life. And recognizing that if I'll ever do that, you'll put everything into place in your perfect timing, in your perfect will, and your love will shine forth for my life. And souls could be saved just because of my surrender to you. Father, forgive us where we fail you. If there's someone here today that needs the light, the love, and the life that Christ brings to each, I pray that they would come today and surrender to you. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you need to come today, if God has spoken to your heart through his precious word, 
uh, we just went ahead and decided to do, dismiss uh, all of our afternoon uh, services and board meetings this week. So uh, we'll also mention all of the things that were on uh, the ballot for last week. All of those passed. Uh, so all of those individuals that you uh, voted for and then also for the budget, uh, it has been uh, taken care of for the year 2021, and we appreciate your input uh, in those things. Uh, yes, Brother Roman. Can I just come out? Yes, if you have uh, if you have a family that you want uh, to have a food basket sent to, we need that uh, ASAP today. Uh, matter of fact, this morning, if you have it with us, uh, please give that to us so we can get it to Ron and Sandy. Uh, they're needing to get those baskets put together early this week. They've got plans uh, later in the week, so we need to get that taken care of if you have a family uh, that you want a basket for. Um, I see. Wednesday night, we encourage you to come and, no, let's see, yeah, next, next week, yeah, man, I, I'm almost ahead of myself, uh, but anyway, we, we've got Wednesday night coming up this week, uh, I tell you, Phil's, Phil's done something pretty extraordinary, uh, he has made every adult on Wednesday night as mad as hornets, I don't know how he, I don't know how he achieved it in the short time that he's been here, but he came up with this, this waffle Wednesday, for the teens. And so all of the teens get waffles on Wednesday night. If you're missing Wednesday night, if you're a teenager, you're missing waffles. The cooler. And it smells all the way through the church, but the adults can't have one. It's blueberry waffles this week. Blueberry waffles. And we can't have them. Just the students. I, don't, I know. It just doesn't seem right. Let's make our own. Uh, and like, I'm going to steal his idea we're going to make our own waffles. No, I, I wouldn't steal his idea. It's special. It's special just for the teens. So anyway, it, it's a lot of good things happening on Wednesday night. We want you to come back and, and be a part of that. 6.30 uh, each Wednesday. Uh, classes for all ages. Lots of fun. Uh, lots of growth. And we encourage you to be back uh, for that. God bless you again. Uh, I feel like I'm missing some announcements, but we're gonna we're just gonna count it good and, and thank the Lord for how good He's been to us. Anyone have I missed anything? I don't like waffles, so I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Even if Brandy liked waffles, he would not let you know. <laughs> he does not like waffles. Anyway, it's it's a good time. It's a good time. God bless you. Thank you for being in service. Uh, let's bow together and be dismissed. Uh, Brother Gail, since you don't get to preach tonight, I want to have you pray for us. How would that be?